Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our study. So we're going to be continuing looking at uh, M. L. Andreas's letters to the churches, and uh, but we'll pray, and then I'm just going to do a really quick review of what what we're studying and why. Uh, but before we begin, let's let's uh, pray together. A dear, gracious Heavenly Father, we invite your Spirit uh, to speak to our hearts. We know that we're exercising our minds, thinking about ideas, thoughts, and things from your word and past history. But we know, Lord, that um, your spirit is here to, to touch us and to help us to understand how much you love us and care for us. And so we just ask that uh, you can help in this study as we talk together. Um, be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I'm just going to give a little bit of a review. So M.L. Andreasen um, was a minister um, who, in his later years, opposed some things that were happening uh, with the leadership of the Adventist Church. Now, when I was baptized on December 25th, 1982, uh, a week later, I went to a... I used to go to a, a thing called teen time. So I was still a teenager. I was 19. I turned uh, 20 uh, in, in 1983 in February. So, um, and my wife at the time, she was uh, 18 when we got baptized and we had, and she was nine months pregnant with our second child. So I got married pretty young, but uh, we were in teen time. And um, so we became Adventists just, out of the blue, um, I had started keeping the Sabbath and I studied all kinds of things on my own. We went to church once then we were baptized. And then the next weekend, the, the uh, New Year's weekend, we were at this teen time camp. It was a retreat and it was it was for the older people. It wasn't for like the young teenagers because some of these people had been in teen time and now they're adults. So it was people in their early 20s. And uh the theme of the retreat was dealing with cults. And so uh, uh, the guy there, Pastor Paul, he um, he did a, he, we watched some videos about some different cults, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons. And, and we discussed quite a bit about cults. And, and so I asked him a question. I said, well, I just got baptized at Seventh-day Adventist. I'm, did I just join a cult? And he said, oh, of course not. He says, you need to read the book, Questions on Doctrine, or not Questions on Doctrine, uh, the book, um, Questions on Doctrine was the result of this, but uh, a book called Kingdom of the Cults by Walter Martin. And the whole reason that book was written is Walter Martin was interested in, uh, he, he wrote for Eternity Magazine. There's this other guy, Donald Barnhouse, who was the editor of Eternity Magazine, an evangelical publication. And Walter Martin was this young guy who was interested in cults. And so he did some research on Seventh-day Adventists. And he set up a meeting with these Adventist ministers in the 1950s, this was. And uh, Adventist ministers, in order to uh, this leadership of the church, in order to sort of court the evangelicals' favor, uh, they modified some of our beliefs. and. So, so I, one of the first books I read after I became an Adventist was this book, Kingdom of the Cults. And so I became aware of a lot of these issues, why people consider the Adventist church a cult. And I've spent most of my life since then, which is a long time ago, you know, studying and reading lots of things against Adventism. I read a lot of stuff on uh, the internet, all kinds of stuff attacking the church. And, uh, but my interest is always never, I've never been that attached to the church itself. I'm just interested in, in what is true. And so I've spent a lot of time talking to all kinds of people, seeing their views and understanding of things. But there are some specific doctrines which I came to study on my own, nothing to do with Seventh-day Adventists um, per se, right? I mean, Adventists believed the same as me. But those, uh, the one particular doctrine we're going to look at right now has to do with the nature of Christ. And so when, when I became a Christian, 
there was a lot of Christians around me, people in teen time, for instance, who they were just concerned about getting saved. I wasn't particularly interested in getting saved. I was interested in changing. You know, I, I assumed, you know, God loves me and he's going to do everything he can to save me. And I wasn't really like trying to gain salvation or anything like that. I wasn't really worried about being lost. What I was concerned about is my effect, how I acted and how that affected other people. So, so I was, I, I read lots of different books uh, before I became an Adventist dealing with um, salvation and trying to understand it. But my main focus was actually uh, the book of Romans and the book of Galatians in the New Testament. And uh, also the letters of John and uh, was interested in Revelation as well. But um, so after I got baptized, I, I continued to study and I came to the view that that the church had actually made a mistake in their courting, courting of the evangelicals and that they rejected a doctrine that really was biblical. And, and that's what we're going to look at. And this has to do with Christ's human nature. So he's going to start here and we're going to look at another paper on this as well. But on, so the book Questions on Doctrine was Seventh day Adventist Answer Questions on Doctrine. That is, the Seventh day Adventists are answering these questions that the evangelicals put to them, right? So this book was published in 1957 and uh, has definitely caused a stir um, over time. And it definitely bore fruit, which was pretty destructive. Anyway, that's what we're going to look at this, this one. Uh, particular point. There's two points, one dealing with um, uh, Christ's work in the heavenly sanctuary, and this point dealing with uh, Christ's human nature. So on page 383 of the book Questions on Doctrine occurs the statement that Christ was exempt from the inherited passions and pollutions that corrupt the natural descendants of Adam. Now, uh, as Seventh-day Adventists, we had always believed that Christ took man's nature and its fallen condition. And that's something clearly presented in the book of Hebrews. So in the book of Hebrews, I'm just going to go there. I'm going to actually look at this first before I, I do a lot of reading here uh, from this paper. So uh, I'll share the screen so you can see my Bible verses there. So in Hebrews chapter one, Paul is going to give a Bible study. Uh, showing that Jesus is God, that he's not an angel. He's not a created being. He's equal with God. And then in Hebrews chapter 2, he's going to show that Jesus is fully a human being. That is, he's both God, you know, and man. That he took man's nature and he came and he died for our sins, right? Now, the purpose in the book of Hebrews is that we're looking at the primary topic, if you wanted to say what the book of Hebrews is about. It's about the new covenant, right, that God made. And he's going to be making illustrations of the new covenant, contrasting it with the old covenant. And the old covenant is going to be based upon man's promises. All that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. The new covenant is based upon God's promises of what he's going to do in our lives. But part of this focus of this covenant is Christ is our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. He's also the offering for sin and all of the things in the Jewish sanctuary symbolize you know, Christ's work. So the whole reason he's going through that Christ is fully God and he's also fully man because he needs to connect man and God together, right? So, so important points, but um, in this section where he shows that he's human, it says for verily he, well, I'm gonna go back even here, um, uh, where he's talking about uh, Christ, uh, where he says, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he, that is Jesus, also himself likewise took part of the same, that he through death, that through death, he might destroy him that had the power of, the de of death, that is the devil, and to deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetimes subject to bondage. For truly he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things, 
it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor or help them that are tempted. So this to me was something when I when I read Hebrews chapter two and I read this book, Kingdom of the Cults, and what the evangelicals said that we had compromised on this particular doctrine, then I knew that there, you know, something was amiss, right? And uh, so M.L. Andreasen, who was uh, there, uh, not at the evangelical conferences, but who was a minister and heard about these things, he's written these letters to the churches, um, telling them about what happened. And in a lot of what he's presented so far, he was talking about the process that he went through before he wrote these letters. That is, he followed Matthew 18. You know, if a brother offends you, you know, go to your brother, you know, work with him. And if he does not hear you, then you go to the church. And so M.L. Andreasen, in, in approaching this, he didn't do this lightly. He didn't just go and say, oh, they did this wrong thing and I'm going to tell everybody about it. He, he tried to, to resolve the problem until it was pretty evident that they had no intention of even even having any sort of discussion about it, that uh, all they wanted to do was remove his credentials, which they eventually did. So he was no longer a minister. They reinstated his, creden uh, reinstated his credentials after he died, which didn't help him much, but it did help his wife. So she was able to get a pension, but... Uh, Anyway, so he says here this statement uh, that Christ was exempt from the inherited passions and pollutions that corrupt the natural descendants of Adam. We could see there we have this verse that he took upon himself the nature of Abraham and that it was in all points it behooved him. That means it was, you know, he was driven to be made in all points like as we are. Right. You know, yeah. You know, he doesn't sin, right? That is, Christ is not going to sin. He's going to be made like us, except that he's not going to sin. Now, that's where some people have played around with these words. Anyway, he's going to say, this is not a quotation from the spirit of prophecy from Ellen White. It is a new doctrine that has never appeared in any statement of belief of the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. And I still think to this day, um, there is the book uh, 27 Fundamental Beliefs, which I read. And they wrote they wrote in there in a way that, you know, it, you know, you can read it one way and it seems to agree with the Bible and you read it another way and it agrees with these new ideas. Um, so it's they, they managed to make a statement that both sides can agree on. But uh, that's not very clear communication. And it is in direct conflict with our former statements of doctrine and has not been adopted by the general conference in a quadrennial session, which when accredited delegates from the whole field are present, as questions on doctrine says, it must be done if it is to be official. Uh, see page nine. It is therefore not approved or accepted doctrine. So in 1957, it definitely was not an approved or accepted doctrine, what they have there in that book the answer they gave to the evangelicals. Now, there are two statements in the testimonies which are referred to as proving that Christ was exempt from inherited passions. So they're going to take two statements of Ellen White's, and uh, they're going to twist these around to try to say that he is exempt from inherited passions. The first says that Christ is our example in all things. He is the brother in our affirmities, but not in possessing like passions. That's Testimonies, Volume 2, page 202. The other states, he was a mighty petitioner, not possessing the passions of our human fallen natures, but he compassed, but compassed with like infirmities, tempted in all points, even as we are. Both these statements mention passions, neither mentions pollutions, and the word exempt is not found. A does Sister White's statement that Christ did not have or possess passions mean that he was exempt from them? No, 
or to not have passions is not equivalent to being exempt from them. They are two entirely different concepts. Exempt is defined to free or excuse from some burdensome obligation to take out, deliver, set free as from a rule which others must observe, which binds others to be immune from. Was Christ excused from a rule which others must observe, which binds others? No. God permitted his son to come, a helpless babe, subject to, not exempt, from the weakness of humanity. He permitted him to meet life's peril in common with every human soul, to fight the battle as every child of humanity must fight it, at the risk of failure and eternal loss. That's a quote there from Desire of Ages, page 49. Now, you know, part of the reason we study these things, and of course people are free to, to make comments, but we're not studying these things to be argumentative, right? We're studying things to, to one is to learn, learn about ourselves and to learn what, what's revealed in God's word. And sometimes people take these issues and they make them issues of, co they're combative in their discussions of them. And, and I, I don't think that that's productive, you know, fighting with somebody over what the Bible says is not, uh, it's not very Christian. Let's put it that way. But we can share the things that we understand. And, and what ends up happening? So how do we put this? So when you have a disagreement with a person, so there's, there's two types of people in the world, you know, those who think there are two types of people and those that don't. No, there's, there's two types of people in the world, right? Um, so I'm obviously sim simplifying this, but there are those who, when they're in a disagreement with someone else, they seek to reconcile and, and come into agreement with other people, right? So there are some people that they're, they're sort of peacemakers. They, they naturally don't like to be in conflict. They would rather be in agreement. And, and the, the natural tendency of that type of person is sometimes to compromise their beliefs or sometimes just to say things in a way that the other person can accept. So, and, 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 you know, if you're a people pleaser type of person, um, and you do think differently, but, but you don't want to be in conflict, you can sometimes try to smooth over these differences, uh, with language, right? Now, this is the work of, um, often people who are in positions of responsibility and they, they want everybody to be at peace. And so they're going to say things in such a way that everybody can agree. Now, is that, is that good or bad? That, that characteristic? It's bad. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It, it seems good on the surface, right? You're a peacemaker. You know, you, you don't want people arguing and fighting. And so, so you, you come up with a language that people who actually disagree, essentially have a disagreement that they can both agree upon. And then you think that you somehow solve the problem. But what you've done is you've just, you just covered it over. Now, I would say my nature is to be a peacemaker. That's actually more my nature. I'm not actually a combative person. So Kelly might disagree from knowing me when I was a teenager. But, you know, I never liked being in conflict. But I also do have another part of me that is so interested in what is true. And also I'm interested in, in communication. That is, I'm interested in actually understanding what people think. So, so I have kind of both of the other characteristics. So I guess there's three types of people in the world. The other type, of course, are these combative sorts. Now, sometimes combative people will take on this uh, this role of looking like they're peacemakers, right? You, you understand where I'm going? Anybody not understand where I'm going? So, so they may have an agenda. Um, so they're not very open. And those people also like to play around with words. But the purpose is not to bring about peace. It's actually uh, to either justify themselves and hold positions of power over others or to manipulate others, right? Does, it, does that make sense? People understand what I'm talking about. 
Uh, those are the type of the people where they say lots of nice words, but the results of their actions are always going to be destructive. And so what they say doesn't really matter. It's the results that they always get that shows really where they're coming from. So what people are complex. Yeah. Like what we're talking about here, Theodore, is whether a person is a Christian or not a Christian, I believe, because basically you'll seek me and find me when you search me for all your hearts. And then Hebrews, not, neither is any creature not manifest in sight, but all things are naked and open under the eye of him who have me have to do. So if we're trying to play games with our words or with what we're doing, then yes, we've probably all done it over the years, but it's something we have to learn when we're doing it and recognize it in ourselves and then come back to what what God wants to mould us to be. And I, I see Andreessen is, has this character, and it's one that um, Darren sent me a, a, an, a, an email yesterday about um, someone in GC somewhere, an African man, that um, was saying in September this just just gone that um, we had nothing to do with uh, telling people to take the injections, nothing at all. And then they showed his, him, the same man in 2022, saying, yes, this is what we should be doing. We all should be telling we've got medical people in our society that says what's the best way to do it. I sent him back a message saying, look, we don't need to be following where people are going wrong. We need to see the ones that are going right and leading Christ, following Christ's leadership. And that's what we all should be doing. We should be looking for Christ in those and around us. And if if anything, we should be reflecting him. It's just what you're talking about here. And, mm -hmm. you know, we do it by our honesty. You know, when I talk to you, I don't say, well, hang on, Theodore, and try to butter things over. I normally... Uh, well, well, you know, I, I'm pretty straight. This is what I think. Yeah. You're telling me what you used to think. And sometimes we don't agree. We don't think, we don't see it the same way, but we're probably talking about the same thing. Yeah. Well, and, and, and I know, you know, it, it's taken me some time to learn because, you know, my nature was to sort of try to smooth things over and to be a peacemaker. And I tried that with my dad, but it didn't really work. You know, so it's, I found that the best thing to do is just communicate as straight and as lovingly as you can, mm -hmm. but never try to hide what you believe or to, you know, manipulate people's words to get them to be at, at peace, right, with others. So, so when it came to this whole issue of of the nature of Christ back uh, in the 1980s when I was studying it, it it, it really seemed to be something that. Uh, that I've seen over time, it's, it's, they, they've played around with words a lot, right? So getting people to say things that they didn't say, uh, getting the Bible to say something it doesn't say. And, and so we need to, we need to realize that the one is we're, we're, we have these problems of understanding. And, um, so sometimes it, it, it can be quite confusing when you have these discussions. But anyway, we're, we're going to read a bit more here, and then we're going to go to another document here. Okay, um, this is um, from Desire of Ages, page 71. While he was a child, referring to Christ, he thought and spoke as a child, but no trace of sin marred the image of God within him. Yet he was not exempt from temptation. He was subject to and he puts in brackets, not exempt from, all the conflicts which we have to meet. So, so we need to understand when it says that Jesus, how it means that he um, he wasn't, uh, what was the statement? How did Ellen White say it? He did not possess the passions of our human fall of na natures, but compassed with like infirmities, tempted in all points like as we are. So part of the thing is playing around with these, what it means to be exempt from our passions, as he say, uh, that they're saying, he's saying that that's what they're saying. And that's different to say that he was not uh, compassed with like infirmities, right? Or what he was not, what not, uh, that's the wrong one. He was not possessing passions. So, so Christ had an opportunity, like all of us, to make choices. And we can see that we also need not uh, be possessed by the passions of our nature, right? So we'll see this here as we go through this study. So this uh, other statement here, God spared not his own son, Romans 8.32. And then Ellen White says, no child of humanity will ever be called 
to live a holy life amid so fierce a conflict with temptation as was our Savior. And it was necessary for him to be constantly on guard to preserve his purity. A man may not have cancer. This is uh, Andreessen's word. But does that mean that he is immune from it or exempt from it? Not at all. Next year, he may be afflicted with it. Sister White does not say that Christ was exempt from passions. She says he did not have passions, did not possess passions, not that he was immune from them. Why did Christ not have passions? He asked this question. The answer, because, quoting from Testimonies 5, page 177, because the soul must purpose the sinful act before passion can dominate over reason or iniquity triumph over conscience. So Christ didn't have passions because he did not submit to the passions that exist in our nature. Even though he had a sinful nature, he did not submit to it. That's why he didn't have passions, right? But he's not exempt from passions. He's Christ, given to the, what's that, Jeff? He didn't give in to the suggestions of Satan. Right. right. He, he overcame his passions. And, and we can overcome our passions as well. Because if we couldn't overcome our passions, we're just slaves to sin, right? We can't overcome yeah. our passions, and all that all that we are to do is just submit to our passions and live a life of corruption and sin, right? So now Christ offers us that so that we can overcome our passions. Okay. Um, I think this is rolled up, uh, Theodore, in, in what we read from education last week, the greatest want of the want of men. Uh, I'll, I'll read it again because I think it's worth reading over and over again. The greatest one in the world, the want of men, men who will not be bored or sold, men in their innermost souls of true and honest, men who in, who do not fear to call sin by its right name, men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle is to the pole, men who will stand for the right though the heavens fall. Now, that's what we ha end up. But this next paragraph, which I mentioned last week, is most important. But such a character is not the result of accident. It is not due to special favours or endowments of providence. A noble character is the result of self-discipline, of subjection of the lower to the higher nature, the surrender of self to the service of love to God and man. And I think if we understand that, and if we do have a, a really understand who God is, you know, I, I always think of, uh, as I said, I just quoted before Hebrews 4.13, you know, Hebrews 4.12 is better, well, we can quote that as well, but I won't go into both of them now. But they're both very, very powerful Bible verses because he, he knows, you know, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharp and any two-edged sword, piercing, even dividing asunder, soul and spirit and joint and marrow, and discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Now, you know, neither is there any creature not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open under the eye of him whom we have to do. Now, if you know those two verses, how can you try to baffle or do something bad to someone else because we have a God who knows the innermost depths of our heart, our soul. And, you know, if you understand that, then you can, you will let God know, make your character what it needs to be. Yeah. So it's a cooperation with us and God. Amen. Right. We, Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. It's Matthew 11, verse 28 to 30, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, so, um, anyway, we're going to go on uh, reading here. So Christ did not purpose any sinful act. Not for a moment was there in him a sinful propensity. Um, this is another word that people play around with. So Christ did not have a sinful propensity, right? Now, does anybody know what a propensity is? Would you say That's more like a desire? Okay. Okay. What's that? Do more I like a desire? Nope. Okay. So, so people just, they have this word and we don't ever look at what it means. And I'm just going to get the dictionary. Yeah, I've never fully understood that word either. Yeah. And that and that's why it's a word that they can kind of manipulate. So natural tendency. 
Yeah, an inclination or a natural tendency to pro behave in a particular way, a propensity for violence. So that means that somebody who has a propensity will do something, right? That is, if Christ had a sinful propensity, he would sin, right? It's not just a desire. It's actually a tendency. That is, he would tend to do that. Where does, where, does it all, where does it all come from, Theodore? Isn't it everything start in the head? Like, you know, it, 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 mm -hmm. it, this is not, well, I, I believe when I look back on my life growing up, my, I was led by the devil all, most of my life and didn't realize it until I was 42 and opened the word of God. So basically it's a matter of recognizing, and I think this is why we need to call sin by its right name and recognize that the thoughts coming in your head are coming from two directions. Mm -hmm. Now, we have to discern which is the two. And this is where well, th those propensities we're talking, you're talking about here, I believe is something that you develop, that you'll accept it. Whereas we have to now get to the stage where we recognize when it's a temptation from the evil one or when you be, whether you're being guided by God. But a propensity. It's actually a, it's actually a two prong. It's actually a two, two, two prong fork. It's our okay. thoughts and it's our thoughts and feelings which mm -hmm. need to be brought under the control of reason and conscience, and that is character development and sanctification. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so, so having a, a, a propensity to sin is not the same as being tempted, right? So if you, if you have a propensity, it means that you do certain things, right? So Christ didn't sin, so he didn't have a propensity to sin. Now, he took upon himself a nature that was a sinful nature, right? So like one of the habit things... Habit forming? What's that? Like habit, habit forming, something like that? Well... It, it, was, a, it was a pull. Like we have, we have our fallen sinful natures have a pull for us to... Of, of the fallen flesh, the desires of... The flesh, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Well, well, you could think of it like, you know, let's say you had an addiction, a, a chemical addiction to something. That would be definitely a pull of the flesh, right? Yeah, and we can be born with it as well. What's that? We can be born born with that pull. Like hereditary? Hereditary and cultivated. So there's hereditary and cultivated. So so Christ had the hereditary part, but not the cultivated part. Amen. Right? So he never cultivated that. Now, so so we all inherit a fallen human nature. Right? We're we're not born with a, a perfect nature. We have these this uh in our in our physical nature, which which includes in some part in some ways our mind, a part of our mind anyway, our thoughts and our feelings. They're not in control by God, you know. So those things, developing a character is, is gaining control of those things. But we, we will see this. He's going to go through the study, and I'm going to read this other article as well, a little bit of it. So so he never had a sinful propensity. There was not for a moment was there in him a sinful propensity. And Ellen White actually has another statement. She says, we need not retain one sinful propensity. So... Um, so propensity has nothing to do with our nature because we don't get a new nature when we're converted. We don't get rid of our sinful nature. We, we do get a new nature in a sense is that we get the mind of Christ. So Christ offers to us his nature to overcome our nature, but we don't get rid of our flesh. We don't get holy flesh. When you're converted, you still have that same nature that Jesus took upon himself, right? He was pure, holy, undefiled. But this does not mean that he was exempt from temptation or sin. He could have sinned. He could have fallen. I'm still puzzled how anyone can make Sister White say that Christ was exempt when she says just the opposite and does not use the word exempt. Right. So so people can play around with words. They can take something. They can add to those words and make you with a little bit of sleight of hand. Uh, think that that person is saying something. I've even had people twist my own words and say, you know, you mean this when you say that. And I'd say, well, you know, I kind of know what I mean when I say something. I don't know if you can read my mind, but I can read my mind. 
So anyway, uh, temptation is not sin. It may become so if we yield to it. When impure thoughts are cherished, they need not be expressed in word or act to consummate the sin and bring the soul into condemnation. That's Testimonies, Volume 4, 623. An impure thought tolerated, an unholy desire cherished, and the soul is contaminated. Every unholy thought must be instantly repelled. Now, we know, of course, all of us have been contaminated, right? Christ was never contaminated in that way because he never sinned, right? Now, so what some people think, they think that our nature is what is sin, and so that if Christ took upon himself our nature— then he was a sinner, that he actually had to have sinned in order to take on our nature. Right? So that's where part of this problem arises. But we'll, we'll go on and read a bit more. Satan tempts us to get us to sin, and God uses controlled temptation to strengthen us and teach us to resist. So God allows temptation. Why? Thank you us. As, as in, it's... He allow he wants us to develop a Christ-like character. If God removed temptation, could we develop a, a Christ-like character? If Adam just and like those, no, just like those who struggle never, just like those who don't lift weights never build muscle, just like those who never resist or choose right over wrong don't develop moral character. Uh, yeah, I've heard, you know, like, obviously, you can't force a rose to bloom and you can't uh, uh, hatch a chicken um, from its eggshell before it does. Right. It needs to go through that act in order to be strengthened. Right. Um, it, it occurs to me the just that thought that, that I shared about a quote from Ellen White, I forget where you find it, but bringing the thoughts and feelings under the control of reason and conscience so mm -hmm. reason is is us god come now and let us reason together yeah, so we both are mind. able to reason and conscience is the holy spirit's voice so it's the cooperation of the two yeah. that, that produces sanctification yeah. okay satan tempted adam in the garden he tempted abraham and all the prophets he tempted christ he tempts all men but god will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Christ was a free moral agent who could have sinned had he so desired. He was at liberty to yield to Satan's temptations and work at cross purposes with God. If this were not so, if it had not been possible for him to fall, he could not have been tempted in all points as the human family is tempted. It's from Youth's Instructor, October 28th, 1899. So this next part here, and then we'll go into this other document questions on doctrines says page 383 that christ was exempt from the inherited passions and pollutions that corrupt the natural descendants of adam every child that is born into this world inherits varying traits from his ancestors did christ likewise inherit such traits or was he exempt here's the answer like every child of adam he accepted the results of the working of the great law of heredity Isaiah ages page 48 what these results were is shown in the history of his earthly ancestors, also from that same place. Some of these ancestors were good people. Some were not so good. Some were bad. Some were very bad. They were thieves, murderers, adulterers, deceivers among them. He had the same ancestors that we all, all of us have. He came with such heredity to share our sorrows and temptations. Jesus accepted humanity when the race had been weakened by 4,000 years of sin, and by accepted humanity, took upon himself our human nature. Not that he accepted us, right? Accepted, accepted taking on human form. Of course, we know Jesus has to be fully God in order to save us, but he also has to be fully man. Mm -hmm. In view of these and many other statements, how can we any say that he was exempt? Far from being exempt or reluctantly submitting to these conditions, he accepted them. Twice, this is stated in the quotations here made, and he accepted the results of the results of the working of the the results of the working of the great law of heredity, and with such heredity he came to share our sorrows and temptations. The choice of the devout Adventist is therefore between questions on doctrine and desire of ages, between falsehood and truth. God permitted his son to come, a helpless babe, 
subject to the weakness of humanity. He permitted him to meet life, life's perils in common with every human soul. To fight the battle as every child of humanity must fight it at the risk of failure and eternal loss. Uh, Christ knew that the enemy would come to every human being to take advantage of a hereditary weakness. And by passing over the ground which man must travel, our Lord has prepared the way for us to overcome. Upon him who had laid off his glory and accepted the weakness of humanity, the redemption of the world must rest. Okay, so I want to look at this other document here. Okay, now this is, um, not even sure who wrote this document, uh, but this is somebody walking, writing about this uh, history. Uh, the doctrine of the incarnation is taught in Adventism. Okay, so this is really picking up exactly the same spot. <clears throat> on the question of the incarnation, questions on doctrine followed closely the articles that appeared in the ministry. The writers of the book declared that although born in the flesh, he Christ was nevertheless God and was exempt from the inherited passions and pollutions that corrupt the natural descendants of Adam. He was without sin, not only in his outward conduct, but in his very nature. So Ministry Magazine at that time put out some articles dealing with Christ's nature. And, um, and so we can see that this is also the same idea in the questions on doctrine. So that he was without sin, not only in his outward conduct, but in his very nature. Now, of course, people play around with this because what nature did Christ have? It's a trick question. What was his nature? It was human nature, wasn't it? Okay, he had human nature and divine nature. Divine nature, yes. Right? So Christ connects divinity and humanity. Divinity and humanity combined does not commit sin. Right? Because God is more powerful than our nature. We are weak. We have a weak nature. God is not weak. He's strong, right? So so it sounds good, you know, like Christ, his very nature, but they're not distinguishing which nature they're talking about. Obviously, his human nature was not divine. This is right? ultimately what we, we need to uh, achieve as well, though, isn't it, Theodore? We, we've got the human the humanity, but we, we need the divine, which will be imparted to us. Right. Yeah. We're not we're not going to get rid of our human nature. We're going to still be human beings. And and even though we're converted, you know, our nature doesn't change. We all don't all of a sudden just uh, we have to deal with that. But we develop a Christ like character. Amen. Because we connect with Christ. You know, Christ is Jacob's ladder that connected heaven and earth. Right. Christ comes down to this earth and brings God and heaven to us. Right. And and he changes us. It's not. I mean, in a sense, we, we could call it uh, a miracle. Right. Because, you know, it is. But it's a miracle that we participate in. God doesn't do it against our will. He doesn't just get rid of our sins because we wouldn't develop a character. We we I have to be like Christ. Ultimately, uh, Alan White said that we will we will be able to do what Jesus did, as his disciples did, if we're when we're at that stage too, Theodore. Which yeah. is quite something to but, look but, but it will be God doing it, right? Amen. Often people, you know, they want to do miracles and they want to do all these types of things, but they really want to do it, right? There it's it's not about because when God uses you, it's not because you you decide and control God. It's because you submit to God. He Amen. He controls you. It's it's quite a different experience than what lots of people think. So people want to have, you know, people want to win the spiritual lottery, right? And if you compare that with, you know, like the lottery with, with salvation, um, you know, God wants to give us everything. But in, in life, God doesn't just give us millions of dollars so that we don't have to work. Right. We have to struggle in this world. And and the Christian life is a struggle. It's it's not something where, you know, you become a Christian and all of a sudden your life is wonderful and everything's you have wonderful kids and wonderful marriage and everything's just perfect and nothing ever goes wrong. A lot of people sell sell that type of Christianity. Right. Really, what they want is your money. 
they want to have that much. Uh, I'll fire this guy. <laughs> yeah. So um, it, it it often gets more difficult. The more the closer we draw to Christ, the more difficult our life can become. But in that difficulty, there's a peace, like like an eye in 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 the eye of the hurricane. It can be blowing all around us, but we can have peace in, in it. Well, you know, and I, I always think of it in relation to, you know, the physical difficulties that we face. Um, you know, I like backpacking, mountain climbing and stuff like that. Uh, it's definitely not easy, but it's there's more peace and joy in, you know, being in the bush for, you know, a week or so uh, than sitting in front of the TV eating potato chips. You know, or other worse things that people do. So there's all these things that offer us joy. But when you do something difficult that's challenging, you know, physically, um, you're going to feel better, right? You're going to feel healthier. Yeah, but we, it doesn't we, mean we, it's... we cannot know true happiness until we struggle. Really, that's yeah. really the thing is. Yeah, yeah. So so things that are painful uh, can be good. Right now, there's bad pain, like breaking your leg isn't a good thing necessarily. But, you know, the pain from climbing a mountain in your leg is is quite a bit different pain than, you know, something that's wrong with you. Right. So, um, you know, so in the spiritual world, we, we need to struggle anyway. So we go on here. Uh, the word exempt has theological connotations borrowed from Rome. James Cardinal Gibbons, in his comments on the dogma of the Immaculate Conception in his monumental work, The Faith of Our Fathers, stated that unlike the rest of the children of Adam, the soul of Mary was never subject to sin, even in the first moment of its infusion into the body. She alone was exempt from the original taint. So Catholics believe in this idea of original sin. And in order for Jesus to be born of Mary, without sin, so that, that he had a sinless nature, Mary had to be born without a sinful nature, with, without a sinful nature, with a sinless nature. Now, of course, why did they have to go back to Mary? Why couldn't they just have Jesus be, like even, uh, you know, why couldn't they just have Jesus just be born with a sinless nature, even though his mom had a sinful nature, right? But they have to have Mary also have a sinless nature. What are they doing? Why did the Catholics do that? One of so if, yeah, Angela, you're, since you were a Catholic. One of the reasons is to draw in nuns. Oh, yeah, one of the reasons is to draw in nuns. But I, I recall reading the King James. I came, came back to where my okay. mother was. And I said, if Mary was sinless, then why does she pray to God, my Savior? My mother was absolutely furious. Yeah. Okay, so so it, it's, it's something that developed over time just to get sin even farther away from Jesus. And this is because they had this doctrine of original sin, right? So in the Catholic Church, you know, that's why, you know, a baby has to be baptized, you know, pretty quickly because if it dies without being baptized, it's original sin. It will, uh, you know, be lost, right? All of the sacraments are really to deal with the different aspects of original sin. So, but that's not really what the Bible teaches by uh, having a sinful human nature, that is, having a sinful human nature is, um, you know, Christ had a sinful human nature. But now, in a sense, we could say he was he took a nature that was condemned, right? So we could say that because in order to, to die for our sins, he had to take a nature that was subject to death, right? Because he never sinned. So in order for him to die, he had to take a nature that was subject to death. But... We doesn't mean that he had to sin in taking upon that nature, right? Where the ca idea of the Catholic of original sin is not just that you get a nature that's condemned, but that you you cannot do good ever with that sinful nature, right? You you have the sacraments that have to deal with that. Yeah, Kelly. Oh, sorry, I was just thinking. Yeah, just agreeing. That, yeah, you can't do ever do good if you have a sinful nature because whatever good you would do would be tainted by that nature, yeah? Yeah, so yeah, so it's this very strange idea. So 
So they talk about, you know, I believe in what I call original guilt. That is, all of us are born guilty. Christ was born guilty, but he wasn't born sinning, right? That is, we're, we're all subject to death. We have a nature that's condemned, right? But Christ has redeemed that nature by taking upon that nature and overcoming it on our behalf so that we also can overcome, right? But when people play around with these ideas, it, it's sometimes hard to communicate because people, they change the meaning of the words as you're even having a conversation with them, right? It's like nobody's trying to understand the issue. It's just the party spirit. And, and often what it is, is people want an excuse for their sin. Well, I have a sinful human nature, so I'm always going to just sin, right? And of course, we know in, in addictions, uh, that's one of the things I like about 12 step is it it's really the whole idea of the gospel is you can't just play around with sin. You can't just you can't just say, well, you know, I have the sinful nature, so I'm going to do these bad things because you can see how that that nature traps you. If You're you, the first yeah. to jump in. Yeah. to Like the first steps. Well, I, uh, I can't like we realize that we can't have victory over or addiction on our own. Mm -hmm. We realize that there's a power greater than ourselves that can, that's God, and that I decide to turn my will and my life over to his care. And that's, so I can't, God can, I'll mm -hmm. let him you know, cooperate with him. Yeah. So that's basic, the beginning of the 12 steps. That's sanctification, man. <laughs> it's yeah. so cool. Yeah. No, we, we definitely can't, overcome we we and we try <laughs> like you nothing know nothing wrong with trying that what's brings that us to the i say there is nothing wrong with trying nope. actually because it brings us brings us to the end of ourselves when we read that's how we realize we can't if we didn't try oh yeah nothing wrong with trying oh, but we do, we do try until we realize we need god and even then that's still sometimes a struggle we want to take over Again, yeah, Angela? I was just thinking uh, what really spurred me to come to Christ after a lot of buffetings and a lot of lot of suffering. I tried to kick speed. The third time I realized I couldn't. And I said, Jesus, if you're real, you can free me from this. And he did instantaneously. And I've never had a relapse and I never had this. Yeah, no, no, that you was know, for and over 50 years. Interesting, too, because as some of you know Peter Plum's story. He was an alcoholic. And he didn't want to give up alcohol, but, you know, he did some, I can't remember the exact details, but basically prayed to God, you know, if, if you want me to overcome alcohol, like, you know, I'm not going to do anything about it because I like drinking, but he just stopped drinking. God just removed it from him. Uh, and well, he, he, be, he began, began to notice that where he would drink a couple of 26 bottles in a night that all of a yeah. sudden a beer he couldn't finish. <laughs> he just, and, and and that's the way it works with drinking. But tobacco, on the other hand, for Peter, he tells stories of uh, throwing yeah. cartons of cigarettes away and being an hour away from the nearest store, getting up at 2 a.m. and driving to get cigarettes. That was the most difficult one for him. Yeah, so, and, and, that, and that was, my point is that God sometimes removes certain things because, we need those things gone or we can't even move on any further. Right. So, so he helps us, but he doesn't take everything away. Right. There's still battles that we have to fight. And, um, but some people, you know, want to have it that God does everything, you know, just, well, God should just do some miracle and I won't sin again. You know, they want to get holy flesh or something. And then some people just resign the fact that, you know, well, I'm just always going to be sinning. So there's no point worrying about it. Right. So you got these two types of extremes. OK. Um, so anyway, it goes on here after talking about uh, what the Catholic Church says. Uh, the main thrust of the view presented in questions on doctrine, however, was pegged to the word vicariously. After quoting from Isaiah 53 and Matthew 8, this comment is made. It could hardly be construed, however, from the record of I either Isaiah or Matthew that Jesus was diseased 
or that he experienced the frailties to which our fallen human nature is heir. But he did bear all this. Could it not be that he bore this vicariously also, just as he bore the sins of the whole world? Now, of course, they're introducing this uh, theological term vicariously. So what does vicariously mean? Well, I'll type it in here. Vicarious, I spelled it wrong. But it, like, a, like a proxy. Yeah, in a way that experienced in the imagination through the actions of another person. She was living vicariously through her children. Well, that's one definition. Um, what's what's it? Somebody said something. Uh, so the Latin influence is the word uh, vicarious. So it's a substitute. Okay, well, okay, Kelly, you got somebody uh, talking uh, in the background there. Can okay, mute you there. If you experience something vicariously, in a sense, you're a substitute who gets something secondhand. Okay, so the idea here then of this um, vicariously, um, he bore our sins, that is, he was our substitute. Now, how could he have bore our fallen human nature vicariously? Like, you understand what it almost seems like you can't really use that word. Like he can take up our sins upon him vicariously as a substitute. But does that does it even make sense to anybody? Not really. I mean, if he's going to bear our 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 human human and humanity or humanness, then what are we? Just empty shells? You know what I mean? Like he's yeah. going to take not only our sins but but our our human. He's going to take our, our our humanity from us. That is <laughs> kind of absurd. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what they would mean by that. Okay, but well, anyway, go on. There's still more to this quote, I guess. These weaknesses, frailties, infirmities, failings are things which we are, with our sinful nature, natures, have to bear. To us, they are natural, inherent. But when he bore them, he took them not as something innately his, but he bore them as our substitute. Now that makes no sense to me, right? Um, he bore them in his perfect sinless nature. Again, we remark Christ bore all this vicariously, just as vicariously as he bore the iniquities of us all. So, so one thing that's really interesting in this quote, um, uh, which is from uh, Questions on Doctrine, and they're going to, like, this is such nonsense. But what they're trying to do is, uh, they want to preserve that Christ has a perfect sinless nature. Now, Christ does have a perfect sinless nature. That is his divine nature, right? But we're not talking about his divine nature. We're talking about his human nature. So his perfect sinless nature, his divine nature, took upon him, or he took upon our sinful nature. But to say that he bore this vicariously is utter nonsense. It's not, it's not, it's not, um, it doesn't make any sense. Okay. Right. It, it, it's meaningless to, to do this. Right. Now to say something innately his, Christ took upon himself our nature in its fallen condition. That was his human nature. Right. He didn't pretend to take our nature. Right. OK. So anyway, this author here and I still don't know who it is. I, I guess I should probably find out. But it was a good article. So I just thought we could read it. Um, so he's going to quote uh, a little bit um, here from Andreasen in a bit. So I'm not sure who this guy is. Anyway, he says, I recall as if it were but yesterday, the day following the close of camp meeting in Indiana, where I was ministering. Uh, of being called off to a work by T.E. Unruh. I'm not sure if that's how you say his name. He was one of the guys who was on this uh, general conference committee that met with the evangelicals. Anyway, the president, to meet with Elder A.V. Olson of the general conference, who had been the principal speaker that year. The objective of the meeting, which was held in Unruh's camp meeting office, was to interrogate me about my position on the incarnation. That is a story in itself. During the session, Unruh and Olson got into an argument as to whether Christ could take a common cold. I was amused. 
but reminded me of the history from the Middle Ages of the scholastic debates over how many spirits could dance on the point of a needle. I laughed, and this brought a verbal blast from Unruh. It embarrassed Olson, and he quickly ended the meeting because he had to catch a plane. In parting, he assured me that he had not requested the meeting. When questions on doctrine reached the ministers and lady of the church, reaction was swift and pointed from those who knew what the church had taught in regard to the nature of Christ had assumed uh, in regard to the nature Christ had assumed in becoming man. Elder M. L. Andreasen met the issue head on through mimeographed and printed letters to the churches, which is what we've been reading. He presented to all who were willing to read about the compromises resultant resultant from the illicit fraternization with the evangelicals by the leading ministers at the headquarters of the church on the subject of the incarnation. Andreasen wrote. So this is the page that, that we were actually just reading. <laughs> okay. So um, so let's go back to Andreasen's paper. Um, <clears throat> so he's going to address this idea of the law of heredity. Okay. The great law of heredity was decreed by God to make salvation possible and is one of the elemental laws that has never been abrogated. Take that law away, and we have no savior that can help or uh, be of help or example to us. Graciously, Christ accepted this law and thus made salvation possible. To teach that Christ was exempt from this law negates Christianity and uh, makes the incarnation a pious hoax. May God deliver Seventh-day Adventists from such, such teaching and teachers. Okay, now he's going to deal with this idea of pollution. So he dealt with uh, the passions. Now pollution. I've not touched upon the subject of pollution, though it is mentioned in questions on doctrine in connection with passions. Right, and they had mentioned it in this other article we were looking at. Christ was subject to the great law of hereditary, but that has nothing to do with pollution. Impure thoughts tolerated, unholy desires cherished, evil passions indulged in, will issue in condemnation, pollution, will issue in com contamination, pollution, and downright sin. But Christ was not affected by any of this. He received no defilement. Jesus coming to dwell in humanity received no pollution, right? So, so they mix these two together, passions and pollution. You know, they use a little bit of uh, alliteration there to sort of tie them together. But... Christ didn't have the, the, the propensity to sin, right? Uh, he had the passions that we have, but he was not polluted. That is, he wasn't a sinner, right? Now, in the Catholic view, when you take, when, you, when you're born, you are, you are not just with the idea of the doctrine of original sin. You are polluted and you are, you know, completely sinful in every single way, and that they try to divorce Christ from all of that. So, so they put passions and pollution together, but we can see that they're not the same thing. So Christ, he he had our nature, right? He didn't he didn't submit to the passions of of our nature, right? And he and he wasn't polluted, but he wasn't exempt. From these passions, right? Which is what they try to say. But because he overcame his nature, he also you didn't you don't inherit pollution. That's something that that you have to participate in, right? So passion and pollution are two different things, and they should not be placed together as they are in questions on doctrine. Passion can generally be equated with temptation, and as such, is not sin. An impure thought may come unbidden, even on a sacred occasion. But it will not defile. It is not sin unless it is dwelt upon and tolerated. An unholy desire may suddenly flash to mind at Satan's instigation. But it is not sin unless it is cherished. The law of heredity applies to passions and not to pollutions. If pollution is hereditary, then Christ could ha would have been polluted when he came to this world and could not therefore be that holy thing, Luke 1.35. Even the children of an unbelieving husband are called holy 
a statement that should be a comfort to the wives of such husbands. 1 Corinthians 7.14. As Adventists, however, we do not believe in original sin. Right? So, so the doctrine of original sin is understood by the Catholic Church and most of the Christian world who believe in it is something that we don't believe in. We do believe that Christ had a fallen nature, but we don't believe in original sin. Now, I prefer to use the term original guilt. That is, man is born guilty, condemned, but that's not the same as original sin. We just have a nature that's subject to death. And so we need a savior. Even if we had never personally sinned, we still need a savior. Anyway, on this matter of pollution, there's much to say, but as the problem we are facing deals only with passions, we shall not discuss pollutions further. On occasion, I may have more to say about passions, for I consider the statement in question on doctrine, deadly heresy, destructive of the atonement. Uh, my next letter will be the last one in this series. But if the reader will consult the list of 10 subjects, which I have enumerated elsewhere in this letter, he will see that there is yet much to be done, and that list is not exhaustive. However, I shall give time for what I have said to sink in, for large bodies move slowly, and it takes time for the leaven to leaven the whole lump. But the leaven is working, and in due time, expected results will come. But I am in no haste. Time is with truth and truth will make its way, and is not dependent on any human instrument. I get many encouraging letters, and I am thankful for them, and only sorry that I must leave most of them unanswered. One rather prominent man from Washington wrote me the confu that of the confusion existing there and said, We are watching events, and when the time comes, we will be ready to act. Personally, I do not believe that the time is quite ripe, but nearly so. We are with you and you can depend on us. Okay. Um, I'm glad to report that my health is good and that I'm enjoying life to the limit. It is wonderful to live in such a time as this. I'm, I am immortal till my work is done. That may be tomorrow, but if I am so, but if so, I'm satisfied and ready. Um, so he says, greetings to all my friends with 1 Thessalonians 5.25, um, which is, yeah, it's just kind of interesting reading these old letters from, you know, 1958, before I was born, and seeing the problems that exist existed then, and and we can see how these have bore the type of fruit that they have today. So 1 Thessalonians 5.25 is, brethren, pray for us. And of course, we all need prayers. So any final thoughts on on what we've looked at here today. Because I know like last week was, I mean, I thought it was a little bit tough. He was going over through all, all the history of how he, he um, came about writing the letter, these letters to the churches. But here he got right to the heart of these issues. Who is this again that wrote this? Well, th this is M.L. Andreasen. Oh, okay. It's still, okay yeah. article, I, should, I should figure out who this other article was that I read. I don't know. Wish, yeah. For some reason, they don't say who the guy is. Maybe it's at the end of the article. I was uh, just puzzling over. I am in Marshall until my work is done. And I thought, well, that means that God will preserve us until our work is done. And I thought it was a joke at first. I am immortal. And I thought, okay, what can I mean? And then that came to me. I'm immortal until my work is done. Yeah, it's, it's well, you know, it, He's, he's going to be alive until he's he's done. He's going to continue working until his work is done. But yeah, this guy's name is that this other article I read was Elder William H. Grothier. Grothier? So I don't know who How he is. How is it spelled? Uh, G-R-O-T-H-E-E-R. Huh. Odd name. Yeah, he's an Australian. Sounds Dutch, maybe? Did he well, live in Australia or in, in, in America? I think... Um... Terry and Darren and a group went over to stay with a guy called Grothier uh, many years ago. Yeah, William Grothier? Not sure. Yeah. So I don't know when this was uh, originally published or anything. It's just... I think the beauty of what I see in this, the Theodore, which I mentioned last week, is um, M. L. Andreessen has shown a true Christian character. He's He's in a position where he is as a minister, and he's basically approaching it 
the way the Bible teaches us to approach, as we said earlier on, Matthew 18. And he's, he's, you can see his honesty there. He's, he's more Christ-like. And basically, this is what I think is the example for us. And as we go through our trials, uh, it's how are we going to approach him? And what we've been talking about here, you know, exercise the arm, the arm will get strong. We exercise our, our, our belief in God. And when we are completely surrendered to God, as Christ was, then he can use us and work through us, is what we're saying here. And I believe um, Andreessen has done his a good job here, and he's, it's basically we can see it in what we're reading. reading. Yeah, you know, and and I think back, you know, because we started me talking about when I first became an Adventist and and reading the Kingdom of the Cults, and you know, and all of these these issues. So, you know, you you join a church, and uh, right away you know that there's some problems there. And, and often people are looking for like this perfect church with all these wonderful people. And, and, um, and the reality is you know, the church is full of people who are unconverted and many people who just born as Adventists and, and many people who became Adventists and fall asleep and, you know, spiritually. And, you know, so it, it can be quite discouraging, right. If we, if we look at it in one way, but um, uh, for me, you know, the walk of, of getting to know God, because, you know, I was converted when I was 17, uh, you know, as a Christian, became an Adventist in, when I was 19. But, you know, it's been such an interesting journey, like all the things, all the experiences that I've been through. And and so I just find this so fascinating reading Andreasen. It's like what he was going through now. I mean, we've all been through these types of experiences, right? I mean wanting to know the truth, seeing people who are opposed to the truth. And then, you know, how do we react? How do we, we leave things in God's hands? In, in, in a lot of ways, there's things we have no control over. But uh, we do have control over the choices and decisions that we make. These things are allowed so that we can learn to do, trust and depend upon God. But it's not something that naturally we would do. You know, men want to fight. They want to argue. They want to debate. They want to justify themselves. And in nothing here do I see Andreasen trying to justify himself. His 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 actions is are are redemptive in nature. He's seeking to help others. So anyway, so I guess we can close with prayer. And so let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful. We're grateful for the Sabbath and um, I'm thankful that Kelly is here and his friend Jacob and others. We're thankful for the people who watch these videos online. We just pray that your Holy Spirit can come close to them and speak to them. Help us, Lord, in our day-to-day -day struggles as we uh, seek your presence and uh, we ask that you can speak to us and that we can hear your voice speaking that we can obey your voice and that we can be encouraged in spite of the fact of how we see ourselves thank you for all that you have done in the gift of your son who understands the struggles that we face each day uh, be with us now through the rest of this evening and and through the rest of the Sabbath, and we thank you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.